Hi everybody, thanks for checking out my GodotCon presentation. I'm really happy to be part of the event this year. My name is Paul Gistwicki and I'm a professor of computer science at Ball State University, which is in Muncie, Indiana in the United States. I teach courses on game development and game design as well as other topics. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about a year of doing fam jams. So let's start by tearing that funny word apart, uh, because more important than my being a professor today is that I'm a member of a family. Uh, I'm married and I have four boys and we like doing fun activities together uh, and one of the things we started doing in 2020 are fam jams. So, okay, so what's a jam? Now at Godokan, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with the idea of a game jam, but for those of you who may not be, the idea of a game jam goes back to the idea of musicians jamming, right? In a jam session, every musician brings whatever their instrument is, whatever their interests and talents are, and you see what you can make out of that collection of people. A game jam is the same idea. You get a bunch of people together, everybody brings their ideas and their interests, and you see what kind of neat thing you can make. My favorite game jam is Ludum Dare, uh, and I like the traditional competition form of it because a single person works on a single idea and you create all of the code, you create all of the art, you create all of the music, you create all of the story uh, on a shared theme within a tight deadline. And that's a great individual exercise. I've also participated in and hosted Global Game Jam, where you get people together from the region and they work together to create original games based, again, on a, a shared theme. In fact, Global Game Jam is coming up next weekend, and I hope you all can participate. My oldest son and I have done some jams together, and occasionally during a Ludum Dari, maybe uh, other members of the family will do their own little projects. I'd been looking for ways to try to combine my love of making games and jamming with my family, and I'm indebted to my friend Ian Schreiber, who teaches at Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. Uh, he introduced me to the idea of a fam jam, which is a game jam that you do with your family. Uh, he said there's really two rules that make a fam jam work. One of them is you put a kid in charge. So this inverts the normal family power structure, right? Instead of the kid having to obey the parents, uh, the kid gets to tell the parents what to do. Um, and, you know, that by itself is, is a good idea, but what really makes it work is that we leverage the superpowers of each of these different classes of participants. Now, the kids have the superpower that they are endlessly creative, right? There are really no bounds to their imagination. And adults have the superpower that we know how to get stuff done, right? We can set up schedules and goals. And so put those together and you have potentially a really effective fam jam. Now, in March 2020, of course, we saw this outbreak of the global pandemic and we started to see all the lockdowns. Uh, in fact, I asked my youngest son to draw me a picture of what does the pandemic look like, and uh, he produced this, so you can puzzle over that for a little while. Um, but all of the events were canceled, the things we were hoping to do as a family were, were put on hold. Um, you know, we all get along well, but we had to figure out what are we going to do now that we have this, you know, lockdown. We don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know what the future is going to hold. And uh, I went back to my conversations with Ian and thought this would be a great time to do a fam jam. So one Saturday morning in March of 2020, I said, today we're doing a fam jam. We're going to work together and make a game. And I told my youngest son, um, you're going to be in charge and let's go. By the way, uh, I hadn't actually told my wife that I was going to do this, and I recommend to you uh, married people out there, make sure you tell your spouse that you're going to plan this. So, um, we started first thing in the morning, we put the youngest guy in charge, and he started explaining this idea, we encouraged him to draw it out, um, and here is the original drawing, so we can see uh, in the main box here, that's his original sketch of... Uh, you being a mushroom man and you shoot circles at the turtle who shoots triangles back at you. Um, there's a way to block. The seahorse was added later. Uh, he described the inputs and drew the buttons up here with our annotations saying, well, this is like an A button and a B button. And the story of the game is that the mushroom man is trying to save uh, Joe Johnson, who is this guy over here in the pink dress. Um, you're trying to save Joe Johnson, who got captured. <laughs> well, you know, keeping in mind this idea that my friend Ian had given me, that you, you just put the kid in charge and, and go with it, um, we said, great, let's build this. One of the first things that we had to figure out from a technical point of view is, how are we going to build this? Um, now, I've been doing game development for a long time, but my main tool up to this point had been Unreal Engine. Um, my oldest son had done a little bit of Unreal Engine, kind of uh, along with me in some jams, um, 
but it seemed like that was too heavyweight of an engine to use here. Now, previously, my oldest son and I had both done the Godot engine tutorial. Um, that was about January of 2020, so it had been a couple months. And the day before this jam, because I knew that I had this in mind, I did a, just a very minimal tech demo to figure out how the HTML5 export would work. Because I had this in the back of my head, I was thinking, if we worked on this project, I would want to share it with uh, the family who we, we knew we couldn't see because they were, you know, they're distributed all over the country. So based on that, we said, well, let, let's try Godot Engine. Let's just give it a shot. So we worked all day. And really by uh, 9 o'clock that night is when we finished the game. Uh, we produced this game called Joe Johnson Gets Captured. Let's take a look at it right now. So that's Joe Johnson gets captured. It's a little hard to follow what's happening. We followed the exact game mechanisms that my youngest son, who was five at the time, said he wanted to use. Um, it defies some genre expectations, I think is fair to say. Uh, but we built it, and we had a great time building it. And so the next day at, at lunch, we talked about um, what did we learn by building this? And I want to share that with you now. So one of the things we learned was storyboarding. Now, early on in the jam, uh, my third son asked what he could do to help. And I said, well, why don't you storyboard the project a little bit? And of course, he had no idea what that meant. So then I had to teach him what that was. Um, and my youngest son described this process as how to draw a computer, by which he meant draw the thing on paper that you want to appear on the screen, um, which you know for them was a new idea because they'd never had this kind of power before. Something else that they learned was how to use Audacity. So uh, last year, I released my first commercial game on uh, Google Daydream, which at the time it was a dying platform, and, and now it's gone. Um, but I showed them how I recorded in Audacity my own voice and then used some of the tools in there to modify it. And oh, they loved that. They'd never done anything like that before. But, but what a trip for a bunch of kids, right? To take the laptop and speak into it and change your voice, make it high and make it low, right? It's a great time for them. Um, my oldest son and I, we learned how to do collision handling in Godot Engine, which, you know, the first time you do something like that, it, it's tricky, right? We really didn't have a good understanding of the node system or the collision shapes or any of that. So, you know, things that are now very easy for us were at the time a bit tricky. One of the really exciting things that my oldest son learned was code quality. Now, again, up to this point, he had been doing some programming you know, for a while, but whenever we worked on game projects, you could say that he'd been a, a legitimate peripheral participant, right? So he'd been doing things that were important, but not really central to the game. Um, and now as we've been doing more and more jams, uh, he's become much more fluent with his programming. And this was the first case where he realized code quality really mattered. So. In one example, he had uh, two blocks of code that were just copy-pasted code. And I looked at it and said, well, what would happen if you wanted to change that time out? How many places would you have to change it? And he said, well, every place I pasted the code. And he realized if you extracted a uh, literal value out into a variable, suddenly you had much more robust code. And it actually made us uh, do better work, right? It actually helped the project. So again, as a, as a professor who teaches code quality to undergraduates, and as a father who wants my kids to do good work, this is really exciting for me. Uh, my wife used Inkscape to do a lot of the processing of the images, and she really didn't have much experience with that before, um, but she came to appreciate what a good tool that is, and this will be something we see used again throughout our series. Now, this one really made me laugh because whenever I teach my multidisciplinary undergraduate game studio courses and, you know, inevitably the first iteration doesn't go as well as everybody wants for their projects and I say what went wrong, they always say communication. And, you know, I laugh and say, it's always a communication problem. What do you actually mean? Um, but when I talked with the family about this game jam, they really had the same answer, which was the communication, right? There's so many moving pieces and so much to coordinate and they, you know, the first time you see those cracks, you don't really know what to call them. But, but this is a great step for us to realize how we might want to do it better. And that's important because 
one of the things the kids learned was they had a great time and they wanted to do it again. In fact, I think my second son would have been happy just doing it again the next day. Um, and the third son thought, ooh, I, I can be in charge next time, right? Because if we go up the ages, right, then I get to tell everybody what to do. Um, so everybody uh, was really excited to start again. And in fact, the next day, I was reading Godot documentation. My oldest son was reading Godot documentation. Other kids were getting back into Construct and Kodu and other tools they like to use just to try to get in there and, and make their own stuff. So the next month, we decided, well, let's, let's try it again, right? We don't want to do this every weekend, but let's try one in April. So 9 o'clock was too late to finish on the last one, right? Really, that was, that was too long of a day. It was pretty stressful. So, so this time we gave ourselves a deadline. And again, the first time we didn't have a hard deadline. We just finished when we were finished. But this time we said, let's start right at 7.30. We'll get, make our tea and get started. And, um, and we'll finish by 8 o'clock, give ourselves a firm deadline. So on that day in April, we ended up making the rocket and UFO game. Let's take a quick look at it, and I want you to pay special attention to the flames on the back of the rocket. Now, that one starts to look a little bit more like a video game, doesn't it? Um, I wanted to call your attention to those flames on the back of the rocket because my second son had recently taken a stop-motion animation class that was taught by an animation professor at my university, and he was able to take that idea from stop-motion and apply it to a flipbook animation within Godot Engine. So I thought that was a neat example of, of transfer of understanding. Early in the morning while working on this project, uh, my wife and I got into a little bit of a, a disagreement. Um, and part of it was thinking about how to work in small slices, um, you know, how to complete one feature before moving on to something else. Um, and then we also had some trouble, I was trying to explain to her the idea of uh, rendering the text in the engine so that we could easily change it and manipulate it rather than burning it into an image in, in GIMP or Inkscape. Um, but it was through that disagreement that I realized that although we had all the kids active in a really legitimate way, um, she was kind of on the periphery. She was just sort of doing, you know, scanning and, and uh, image editing. Um, she wasn't really central to the process, but she should have been. So I did what any loving husband would do. Uh, I taught her command line git. So we put Godot Engine onto her workstation. Um, I taught her how to use command line git so that she herself could, could grab the project and look at it. And I showed her just very, very quickly how to go in and move things around in the, the controls editor, right? How to put in labels and buttons and stuff and without getting into any of the scripting at all. But she took to it like a, a fish to water, right? This, this was really familiar to her because she has, she has a background in desktop publishing. Um, so arranging these things, you know, putting in the fonts, um, that became very quickly her ballywick. Now, of course, on this project, we had a little bit of trouble because, you know, you might have forgotten to say, I have the scene checked out, and then you have two people modifying the scene, and then you get uh, merge conflicts. But, you know, that's normal. Uh, and at least it's easier to do it with the tool than to do it without any version control at all. So our second fam jam turned out to be a success and we learned a lot from it and we learned a little bit more about how to work together. Uh, and of course, April 2020, we still really didn't have much idea of what was going to happen with the pandemic and the lockdowns and all. And so we decided let's try to do one a month and we'll rotate who's in charge. Um, and we've done that. Uh, in fact, at the time of this recording, we've done one every month through December and we have our January one planned for tomorrow. What I'd like to do now is show you some highlights of games from the last year so that you can see individual pieces like how we learned how to do new things and where new ideas came in. Um, and then we'll use that to drive a couple of conclusions that maybe you can take with you if you wanted to try to do something like this yourself. In June, we made the game Get the Food. And who had been doing the composition had been rotating a little bit. Uh, I'm a musician myself and I, I love making music, but I'm also kind of the producer slash mentor slash developer. Um, and so I don't always have time to get my, my fingers in there. And I want to enable my kids to do a good job. Um, 
Now, my third son, who is very excited about doing this music, has really no musical sense, right? He's taken some piano lessons, but he doesn't know much about composing. But it dawned on me while I was working with him that instead of trying to get him to work in a key like C major, I could say, well, just use the black keys, right? Use a nice pentatonic scale, and we won't get quite so much dissonance. So let's take a quick look at Get the Food, and you can hear the difference between the title music and the in-game music, right? The title music was what was written first, and the in-game music was after we talked about pentatonics. So this was a fun, relaxing game, and we got a nice, fun, relaxing soundtrack. In fact, uh, the original music that was written for it was this in intense, percussion-heavy piece, and we got to talk not just about how to introduce pentatonics to get rid of dissonance, but also how to try to match the theme of the music with the theme of the game. Forest Runner was made in July, and it was our first one that used parallax scrolling and cutout animations, which are two of the technical features of Godot that my oldest son and I especially were really excited to explore. So let's take a quick look at that. It's not going to win any awards, but it's clearly recognizable as an endless runner, and we had a really good time building it. It wasn't until October that we really landed on the, uh, what's become a crucial concept for us, which is making better use of our artists. So, again, my, my oldest son, he does programming, and, and really by October, he could have built almost any of these himself. I like to think I'm still helpful, but he's become quite adept with GDScript. Um, but my second son and my fourth son especially, they like to do a lot of the drawing. And the previous games, they just didn't have enough art for them. And so in October, we made a, a conscious decision to say, let's make a game where we can include more of the skills of everybody. Um, so we don't have the case where, you know, you draw your figure and then you're just kind of out of the project for a couple hours. So with this game, we have in the flying planes, uh, different planes that were drawn by different people. We also have hot air balloons that were all created in Piskel, and we just rotated who was sitting at the computer and went through and created a bunch of them. I even made one. Also, notice the backgrounds. So my wife had been tinkering with Inkscape, and she would, between jams, always try to learn something new, uh, inspired by the jam, right? So I'd find her days later, uh, watching YouTube tutorials, trying things. And here we can see she's made this nice series of backgrounds that we made into a parallax scrolling. Um, and that'll be something that we see in future games as well. Let's take a look at The Flying Planes, which is probably my favorite. Nice classic sort of Flappy Bird style gameplay, and uh, I think this is the one the kids like to play the most too, although I can't remember their high scores right now. So that was a fun selection of games that we've created. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about the process that we follow to create our games. Our schedule looks like this. In the morning, I'll make my cup of tea, and we'll appoint the creative director for the day. The creative director might already have ideas because usually they know ahead of time that they're going to be the director, or maybe they'll just go off by themselves and sketch a little bit and then come back and present to us. We've been encouraging the kids to uh, draw their ideas just to make it easier to communicate them, and I think they've all realized the advantage there of having a concrete thing to point to rather than just spewing ideas. Then 
and this is really crucial, we have a whole family discussion of that vision. Uh, I think early in our series, we gave too much autonomy to the director, and that led sometimes to the other members of the family feeling like their contributions weren't going to be quite as uh, recognized or, or valued. Um, but now we talk really specifically about what does any member of the family want to do today? You know, does, does this person want to try writing the music or doing the sound effects? Or is this person really excited to do some, some uh, pixel art or maybe some hand drawings? And we try to bring that all in. And you'll find in our later games too, again, like I showed in the Flying Planes, a lot more artwork, a lot more opportunities where people could draw things and we can put them into the game. Then we have a morning work session. Uh, somebody makes breakfast, thank goodness, um, and and we work. And usually what happens is my older son and I prototype the core gameplay just using primitives, uh, while some of the other kids start sketching out the composition or drawing some of the characters that we can start putting in just to get some idea of what it might look like. By lunchtime, we're all ready for a little break, and so you know, being a family all in the same house, it's really easy to sit together and have a nice lunch, and then talk about, you know, what did we see? What did we try? What are we frustrated by? Do we think we're going to meet our original goals? Do we need to pivot? You know, all that sort of stuff, um, and that goes really well because in the afternoon we can work for a bit, and and now our goal is always to be done before dinner time, right? Nine o'clock was was way too late because half the kids are in bed, uh, and even the 8 o'clock deadline led to us working too long and, and kind of wiping ourselves out. Um, but treating it like a regular kind of work day, it being done by dinner time, has worked really well for us. It also means that at after dinner we can go for a family walk through the neighborhood and everybody share a little bit about something they learned or something new that they saw. So in preparation for this presentation, we had a little family meeting and I asked everybody to share with me what they have learned from a year of doing fam jams. Um, in fact, I have copious notes from that discussion and I may have to write a blog post about it later because I can't fit them all in here now. But what I've tried to do is distill them down to the ones that I think might be most useful to somebody who's thinking about doing something like this with their friends or family. So. Here's a real simple one. If you have young kids and they're doing hand drawing like our kids love to do, uh, in our original games, people would just draw anything they want. So this is from our November game. And you can see that the, the drawings are all different sizes and scales. Um, notice too, they're all in, in marker. Originally we used pencil, which is just really hard to scan. But now we make sure they use pen or marker. Um, but my wife's got this great idea where she could give them a frame in which to draw. And so after she gave them a frame, then they were able to use a light board and draw on it and keep all the uh, spaceships in this case to be roughly the same sizes. So that's worked really well for us. And again, if you have young kids, this might help them control their uh, the space in which they're creative. So let's talk about some of the other things the family learned. Finish before dinner is better than finish today. Like I said earlier, this idea that we can all be done at dinner time and have a casual conversation, go for a family walk after sitting on our butts all day, um, that's a real good thing. So anybody who does software development is, should be familiar with this idea that we want to work in small slices. And it can be a hard thing to explain, you know? So my wife asked me, how do I know where to slice a project? And Boy, that's hard to articulate to my family as well as it is to my students, right? You, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I think my whole family has seen that happen, where now we see better how we can take something like an endless runner and you know just get the jumping working. And once we get the jumping working, then we can worry about other pieces, like uh, in our December game, you know, where do you spawn the ornaments that the elf is going to pick up? I mentioned this before, but I think it merits repeating. Young composers using a tool like LMMS, which is what we use, uh, they can use pentatonic scales. And, you know, if you don't and you really like dissonance, um, and, you know, my kids actually do, <laughs> then you could certainly just let them go to town. But if you want to get something a little bit more melodic, then pentatonics work really well. In our most recent Fam Jam project, we also experimented with having the kids transcribe music from sheet music in their piano lesson books into LMMS, and I think there's a good lesson there about this um, isomorphism between the score of the music and how it's represented in something like the piano role of LMMS. This is maybe the most powerful thing that came out of this whole experiment. And that is my, my second son articulated it this way. He realized that being in charge doesn't mean just telling people what to do. It means you have to 
talk with people, you have to listen to people, you provide some advice and feedback. And this is something that all the boys do so much better now than they did before. Um, rather than just tell people, you know, this, this is bad, it's not what I wanted, or, or looking over their shoulders and criticizing every move, they understand that everyone is trying to contribute and the creative director is not so much telling them to do things, but managing that exercise, right? Getting everybody involved, getting everybody to do their best. And that's a great thing for a family to learn, or really for anybody. Now, for me, one of the biggest outcomes of this, the most important outcomes for this, is that the kids are inspired to be makers. Um, I love video games. I've loved video games for a long time. Um, I like to teach people to make games. I like to play games. But I, I know, in part from my studies of games, that it's easy to get trapped in playing games and thinking that you're doing something important because the game gives you all these uh, feedback loops, you know, to say like, hey, yeah, spend more time, spend more money, spend more attention on this game. But it's not actually important, right? It's not really creative. Making games is great because it's one of the most challenging things we can do, right? We have to bring in insights from all different areas. We have to bring in all sorts of different skills and perspectives. Um, so I love the fact that my kids are inspired to be makers. My older sons are making their own games in tools like uh, Godot and Construct. The younger ones are using tools like Kodu. Um, and they're exploring ideas like uh, how to do sound effect processing in Audacity, how to write music in LMMS, how to use tools like GIMP and Inkscape. This is a great outcome for me. So I hope you found that inspiring. All of our games are available at this URL. They're all free and open source. You can get access to the GitHub repositories for all of them. If this has inspired you to try something like this with your family, please send me a link. Let me know how this goes for you. Also, the website links to my blog where I've written extensively about several of the projects and what it's like to run fam jams. Once again, thank you to the organizers of GodotCon for organizing this event and for allowing me to be a part of it. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Happy programming.